Good evening and welcome to LMR Live. This is episode number 44 coming to you from the University of Mississippi where education and entertainment intersect and we bring you what? What? Edutainment. That is right. This is our grand finale of season 10. Yes. 10 years ago, we launched this in this theater, the Studio Theater at the Ford Center at the University of Mississippi with LA-based composer Sarah Grafe. And tonight, to end this epic season, we are back in this space with some new furniture, yes? Yes? I need to give shout outs here. So this set was beautifully selected, curated, put together by our dream team most significantly by our graduate assistant, Giovanni Correa Coleman, and our undergraduate assistant, Benton Donahue. Give them a round. <laughs> Let us know what you think, but I have to say it's fabulous. I feel, I feel so like fancy. I don't know, I feel wonderful. It's gorgeous. So kudos to them. So we think about season 10 and coming back to the space. It just seemed right to have a West Coast person with us again. So tonight, our guest is Glenn Ballard. Glenn is here to receive the Medal for the Arts, the highest honor given to an artist or supporter of the arts from Mississippi's flagship institution, the University of Mississippi. But this man did not just come to receive this medal. This man came to work with students. He came and he will be part of the concert tomorrow night, Medal for the Arts, on the main stage of the Ford Center Theater. Um, so, who is Glenn Ballard? I don't need to tell anybody because you, you know who he is, but let me just give you a little snippet. Glenn is a Natchez, Mississippi native, an Ole Miss alumnus, the 2023 recipient of the University of Mississippi Medal for the Arts. I will keep saying that, I'm pretty proud. And he is soon to be the 2023 inductee into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in New York City. Alongside Snoop Dogg, Gloria Stefan, and others, we know these names, Ballard a multiple Grammy Award winner and an Academy Award nominee has worked with, get ready for this, Aretha Franklin, Natalie Cole, Aerosmith, Dave Matthews, Katy Perry, and I could go on and on, but we want to get him out here, so I need to be quiet. And he helped launch the debuts of Paula Abdul, Wilson Phillips, Alanis Morissette, to name a few. Ballard's Hollywood-based international production company focuses on developing projects of musical theater, episode TV, and streaming feature films and live music events. <sighs> Help me welcome Glenn Ballard. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please have a seat. Pinch me. Pinch me. So I feel like I've known you a long time. We just met in August when we traveled out uh, to, to ask you if you would be the recipient. But you're just, I just feel like I've known you forever. So thank you for doing this. Well, maybe we did know each other sometime in another life, but I, that's I, another conversation, I think. We could go there. We could go there. <laughs> um, we're going to kick off with a, a segment here. We have a new one, and it's called Truth Be told. It's inspired by French essayist and novelist Marcel Proust, and it's been created by our dream team. So we're going to pull up a question. If you want to pass, say pass. But we just want to just sort of, I don't know, have a little fun to kick things off. So Benton, whenever you're ready, push to start. <coughs> Glenn, what is your most treasured possession? My white grand piano in my studio. An easy answer. I will admit, we, <laughs> my, my co-pilot and all this, Brady Bramlett and I, we so wanted to find a white piano for tomorrow night. We weren't <laughs> successful! And I don't think they'll let us paint the one here at the Ford Center. I didn't say that, uh, but I love that. All right, let's do another one. <laughs> Who are your favorite writers? Literary, musical, however you want to go with it. Of course, we'll start with William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, Joan Didion, uh, Anton Chekhov, and Walker Percy. Good list. Very good list. 
This man is a renaissance man. This man is a refined. He is an intellect. He is all things. I'm a fan. All right, last question. Boom. <laughs> what is your favorite sport? I'm deeply torn because I was a track athlete and a basketball player and a football player and a swimmer. But it's football. Come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm and sorry. You're, and you're a big time Ole Miss sports fan, yes? Oh, fanatical. Fanatical. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. So thank you for our new segment, Truth Be Told. That's the truth. All right. It's truth. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. What was your first instrument? Piano. And, and, you know, it's the easiest instrument to sit down and make a noise out of it. If you play violin, it takes you about a year to, to not make everybody sick, so <laughs> including yourself. So uh, the piano is a great place to approach music because you have kind of, it's right there in front of you, it's kind of geometric. So for me, the investigation at a piano at, at a very, very early age, essentially when I could crawl up on a piano bench, I started my investigation. Bonk, bink, blank, bink, bonk, bink, and that's still what I do. Bonk, bink, bonk, bink, bonk, bonk, and that's how I write songs. That's how I learned music, by just making investigations at a piano. So the pianoforte, which is it, its official name, is, is the great instrument. It's, in my opinion, the greatest instrument ever created. So wow. a shout out to the pianoforte. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. How did you get into music? I mean, family musical, uh, piano in the home, what? Uh, it, it was uh, it was completely self-driven. Uh, there weren't any musicians in my immediate family, and I inherited a piano. We didn't just go out and buy a piano. I just had an unfortunate incident. My aunt passed on and, and left me, left me this piano. So uh, it, it ended up in my living room, and it was like crawl up on the piano bench and start writing songs. Because I I never really learned music. I just started writing. And so it was, a, it was a natural inclination to avoid having to, to learn anything else other than what I wanted to do. It was like an obstinate and completely quixotic idea that I would never recommend to anyone. I, I recommend you come to school here and learn music. <laughs> <laughs> so in your teen years, what were you listening to? I'm just curious. Uh, I was listening to Jimi Hendrix, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Miles Davis, uh, Billie Holiday, Eric Sautee, all of everything of Eric Sautee's I could get my hands on because it's very simple piano music except it's very complicated intervals. Mm -hmm. and so it's like he literally did hundreds of investigations of intervals. The most famous is like Jim Nopedi, these very simple, but I could play those pieces, you know, and I could not play Rachmaninoff. So, uh, but I learned music by just, in a very simple way, investigating these relationships between intervals and how chords had emotional colors, you know? Yes. So for me, it was always an emotional journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have since learned music the hard way, which is like, you got to do this and you got to write this. So, but uh, it started for me just as a completely natural and emotional expression of, of my essence, really. So it, it sort of, that's it. That's how I did it. So coming from Natchez, how much do you think that area influenced, you know, you and then the result of your writing and works? Oh, I'd say about 100%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I've been fortunate enough to find myself in mostly enchanted places. We happen to be in one right now, this very enchanted, vaunted, haunted place called Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. and naturally drawn to those places and all the houses I've lived in in LA and my sons will attest for it are all enchanted uh, and I, I believe that environment is a huge factor in terms of at least my own crea creativity although I've had to write in the middle of a room of 30 actors running around and uh, you know <laughs> us trying to change scenes so I love having a contemplative place to write, but I can also write in a hurricane. So, but I prefer, <laughs> I prefer having a, a sanctuary to retreat to. You know. All right.
All right. So when you came to the University of Mississippi, did you initially start as a triple major, or how did that unfold? Well, you didn't, I, I think you, you were required to have a major and two minors. I think that was the way it was then, back in the day, and I'm talking about back in the day. Just a couple and, years ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I was just interested enough, I, I, rather than take one elective course and, and, and like take a golf course or something, you know, like just to get the hours, I just said, I, you know, I, wanna, I want more of the political science thing, so I just loaded up on political science, loaded up on English, loaded up on journalism, and took probably to the exclusion of everything else, but I was allowed to do that. So, so it, it, and it, it, it's not that I did more hours, I just concentrated on the things that I was interested in. I'm not sure if that's still allowed, but I had a hustle then. Come on, I still do. Well, and I, I mean, I could get on my soapbox on that topic, because I think nowadays there's such a tendency to tick the boxes, as opposed to, I love what you just said, really take the classes and what you're interested in and explore and, and go beyond. I mean, I think that's great. Well, it's probably the only time in your life where we actually be able to follow your intellectual nose, I would say. Just your, when your intellectual curiosity is enough justification for you to just t take a deep dive on whatever it may be whether it's archaeology, history, mm -hmm. astronomy, you know, molecular biology, quantum physics, musical theory. When are you going to have time to take that dive once you get out in the real world and you have to go make a living? Probably never. So I always am reminded when I come back to a campus like this of, of the great time I was able to, to actually just explore without any consequence other than the grade, but but you know, it, 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 I wasn't going to like get fired or something if if they didn't like it. Right, it's a Somebody safe would help me through fail, it. Right? Exactly. So I, I just think that um, that's the gift of a place like this that you have a chance to make mistakes before it, it counts against you. You know, and so you can also, learn from your mistakes. Absolutely, absolutely. I just I promise I didn't prompt him to say this. I mean, I just had this conversation with, with my class the other day, and any student who's worked with me, I'm always saying, this is the time in your life you get to be selfish. I don't mean being a schmuck, but I mean being focused on yourself and your intellectual curiosity. You'll never have this opportunity again. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, wait till you get out of here. You know, Trust so. us. Trust him. Yeah. Trust him. All right, so when you were here, you were editor of the yearbook, yes? yes? Yeah. What color was that yearbook? <laughs> it ended up being green. <laughs> Is there a story? No, Make one I, up. No, I don't it, know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite colors. <laughs> Mine and, too. And I, I, it, honestly, it, we were coming out of, I don't want to speak it in a negative way, we were coming out of the Vietnam War. It had literally just, we, you know, we're finally ending it after like 10 years. I, you know, I, 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 fortunately I didn't have to go, but I did get drafted. I failed the physical somehow, but a lot of my friends had been killed. And so it just felt like there had been an oil embargo and it, it felt like kind of a, a dark time in, this, in the United States. So I just felt like it was springtime, you know, let's, let's make it a green kind of and I, f I sort of feel like we're in a moment like that right now you know so we need another greening another green in a, you know so that was kind of it it was sort of like a little bit selfish on my part but I hope everyone appreciates it I think it's just so amazingly cool you know all whole shelf because it knowing people that have lots of the I yearbooks, know. and there's that one green! And it just, it sums you up, because... You can die you, it if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you stand out beautifully, Glenn. It just represents you so well. Thank you. Anyone else agree with me? Maybe, maybe, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. So, let's jump to you driving to the West Coast. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, big move, big pivot, big brave, bold step. Okay, I'll be very specific about this. On May 11th, 1975, I graduated with distinction from Ole Miss. And the graduation was, was I think it was in, in Hemingway Stadium. And four days later, I got a job from a, a company in Jackson, Mississippi that rents 
caps and gowns for graduation ceremonies. Okay. And I got a job delivering them to the West Coast. I had to deliver them to 25 high schools and, and community colleges in the LA area in a 22 foot rider truck which had a governor on it, which would only go 45 miles an hour. Oh my gosh. It took me a day and a half to get across Texas alone. I thought you were going to say it took you a day and a half to pry that thing off. No, go ahead. <laughs> I, so I did the gig, came out here. I had to back this truck into some of the most precarious places you can imagine. Fortunately, I'm a really good driver. I had a commercial driver's license at an early age in, here in Mississippi, because you can get one when you're 14 if you can drive a tractor. And, uh, <laughs> or a front end loader, which I could do. And so, you know, I drove out, delivered the caps and gowns. Then I had to go pick them up and deliver them back to Jackson, Mississippi. I ended up netting $400 out of it. And I said, this is the worst gig of all time. I will never do a straight job for the rest of my life. If I have to, like, if I'm just going to busk on the street, but I'm never going to let somebody abuse me like that again. So I packed up my car with my $400, stuffed everything I had into a a Plymouth Satellite Sebring, which looked like a burnt cigar. It was brown and <laughs> ugly. And I drove as fast as I could to the West Coast, going 110 <laughs> across Texas to make up for the, the last trip. And that's when I came to LA, probably June 1st, 1975. I had one phone number in my pocket. It was the golf pro at the Bel Air Country Club, Eddie Marins. And he's responsible for everything that's ever happened to me from here on. Thank you, golf. Because I was also a caddy in Natchez, Mississippi. I used to make a lot of money carrying bags of rich guys. That's a so that's story. my story. That is a great story. That is a great story. I love it. Thank you. So what was your first musical job in LA? Answering the phone for Elton John uh, at Rocket Records, uh, it, it, I heard about, uh, there was an artist on the label named Kiki D who did a song with Elton, Don't Go Breaking My Heart. She's a wonderful singer. And she needed somebody to play piano on a demo. And it was like, I saw my opportunity. And it was like, well, I, you know, I can fill in if you need me. And she, I'm the guy answering the phone. And they said, what, you play the piano? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I could do it. <laughs> so. Uh, so I, when I finished my gig, uh, I showed up in the studio and I played it and they liked it. And they went, oh, you're a musician. So it was like, and then there was a, a, a person in Elton's band named James Newton Howard. He was the electronic keyboard player in his band. And James heard the demo and he said, who's that playing the piano? It was like, that's Glenn Bauer. He said, you mean the guy who's answering the phone? It was like, yeah. It's multi-talented. And so he called me up. <laughs> And he said, hey, man, you're good. And so that, that was it. He didn't like say anything else, but it was, like, it was like, okay, that was enough encouragement for me. To, and so then I just sort of working my way into making demos and then blah, blah, blah. But that was my foothold. That was my first job. That's great. That's great. And Bernie Taupin was upstairs on, on the second floor writing lyrics. Uh, and at that time, he and Ringo were drinking, and I would take sake and put it through the coffee machine to warm it up. And it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. But they, they're both off that shit now, so believe me. <laughs> They've learned their lesson. But this is 1975, you have to remember. Uh, all right, it's I want to jump roll. ahead. Okay, to jump ahead. Jump ahead to, no, oh, we can stay here, either way. Um, I'm slowing 1986, you down. 1986, not at all, 1986. 1986, if my notes are correct, um, co-wrote Man in the Mirror. Yeah. And that was also the year with a hit with George Strait. Yes. Well, it was a good, it was a good year. Six was a very good year. I'd say so. Uh, it was just, you know, a turning point probably in my career. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned that I, at some point today, maybe not on this particular broadcast, that I had written a song for the, the album Thriller and I demoed it with Michael, just a really bad demo, but it was, it was called Nightline and we thought it was going to make the record. Then it got bumped by a, a little song called Billie Jean. And so I was left out in the cold. But on the next record, uh, you know, I got to write this song, Man in the Mirror. And that was 1986. It was the last song on the record. It was kind of like 
It was like throwing your bag on the train that's already pulling out of the station, hanging on to the caboose. <laughs> we crawled on, got to the front, and Quincy said, yeah, this is great. Michael loved it, and so it was a good year. George Strait had a big number one record, and it was like, okay, I'm gonna get a check finally. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to borrowing money from ASCAP, you know. Yeah. So in that year, I mean, did it feel like a moment of arrival? You just, uh, you seem like the person to me that never, uh, I'm jumping to a conclusion here, forgive me, that you don't ever get to that moment where like, I've arrived. It seems like you're always no. the person who's like, going, 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 going. But how did, how did that year feel? It just felt like a great opportunity to, to not get kicked out of the business. <laughs> yeah. That was the first thing, because you're, you know, you're terrified. I mean, it, it's, it's, look, it's, the, it's a hard business. I don't recommend entertainment for anyone who doesn't love it because it's so hard. It, but if you love it, there's nothing better. Uh, but you have to take your beatings and, you, and you, you can't take the criticism for your work ever personally. And I, that was one of the earliest lessons I had to learn mm -hmm. of like, don't take it personally. If they don't like it, they don't like it. it they might like you, but they don't like this. Don't go, uh, uh. It is hard, though, I think, for artists to separate, it's you know, the probably the hardest thing in the world from the work because it is so personal. I've had right? to train myself to do it. Yeah. You, you want to emotionally react when somebody says, oh, they, hey. it's like, but I, right. I learned this from Alan Silvestri, one of the great composers. He writes some of the greatest music in the world for some of the greatest directors. He can write a cue and 95 percent of the time the director likes it. And every every time I like it. But sometimes he turns in a cue, and the director goes, no. Nah. And there are many composers who, who will go, who like get in there and like advocate for it. And it's mm -hmm. like, Alan said, never say another word. Just write another cue. Interesting. And that's, it's, it, that's the ultimate wisdom. So if somebody don't like, you know, there's no reason to like, if they're in charge, they're the director, or whatever, that, why, what are you doing? Why fight it? Because you're never going to win that battle. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of, of the wisdom of trying to negotiate through this business is learning which battles to fight and which ones not to. And how not to beat yourself up, you know? I and hope everyone's paying attention to these words. These are some pretty stinking good words of wisdom. Do we agree? Uh, yes? <laughs> well, Seriously, I mean, Glenn, look, I'm taking notes. I, I mean, the, <laughs> the, the rejection it, it begins at the, at the bottom and it never ends, all the way to the top. You know, I... I you know, just did a Disney movie and, you know, half the songs got thrown out, you know, so that happens and you, I couldn't cry one drop, not one crocodile tear. It was just write another song, damn it. So, <laughs> and that's what we did. This is great. All right, I want to move into, I want to get some student questions in here. So we have a segment. What is our segment? What is our segment? On the Line is our new segment. And on the line, first up, we have a student question who wants, student question, wants to know, have you ever felt the crippling fear of not being enough? And if so, how did you overcome and conquer your insecurities, inadequacies? I feel that crippling insecurity every single day when I wake up. I call it morning terror. Mm. I think it was described beautifully by Walker Percy. And I'm just being completely honest. And so my cure for it is to make myself white. It's like I'm going to write my way out of this feeling of insecurity yeah. because I know I can do it. It doesn't always work. But if I don't write, I'll just keep feeling this way. Mm -hmm. And it'll just become a black hole. And eventually, like, you just so, I mean, it's just, even when you're like, you feel like you've got nothing to say, say that I got nothing to say and write it and then it, then you'll have you already said something you know what I'm yeah. saying yeah 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 you know what I'm saying? yeah sometimes the hardest part is just getting started right yeah and it's it, it, and it's just a really good habit when you feel like you're uninspired now you, you're you, you're you're bored with yourself go out and like activate your body you know, I think I said some earlier today, take a cold shower, whatever it is to stimulate your brain. You other do than you every morning. I run. I, I run and exercise. Tell people about this. It's amazing. Well, I mean, I, if, I, if I put off exercising to the end of the day, eventually it ain't going to happen. You know, you just like Amen. you have a million other life swamps, all those great, you know, 
intentions. So if you don't do it early, you ain't gonna do it. I that's agree. that's my thing. And also, there's nobody, nobody's calling you. You, don't, you know, you are absolutely free. If you can make yourself get up early, it's all yours. You have like a couple of hours that you own, and it's enormously liberating for me. I, I run up in Griffith Park almost every day. My sons run up there with me a lot, and it's pre-dawn. It's nature. An hour later, you feel like you're a new man. So. Uh, <laughs> That's my that's my inspiration really, and then then I can sit for twelve or fourteen hours in front of a computer, which is blinking at four thousand times a second, and like, at a, you know, every every now and then I have to stand up because it's really a very unnatural thing to do. <laughs> I've learned I set timers to make sure that I just stand up and stretch and oh yeah, you got to do it. Or else you get so immersed. You, do, and, oh, yeah. you get lost. You go it's three totally. hours later and you're like oh. Yes. Yes. All right. I'm another question from a student. When selecting artists to work with or collaborate with, what are you looking for? What's your criteria? Talent, positive attitude, personality? What would you say? Well, I, I, you know, to be perfectly honest, it starts with a voice. If somebody has a voice that's interesting, then we start there. If, they, if they're not great singers, they got to have everything else. Everything else. Uh, <laughs> And some people can get by with, you know, you know, not being good singers, but like I, so I'm generally start on that level mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be virtuosic. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about voices that have personality. Mm -hmm. The personality of a voice is what sells every record, I promise you. And it's the greatest singers in the world aren't necessarily the biggest hit makers or the most distinctive singers. But when you hear a singer, that can touch you emotionally, that's your fingerprint, you know? And so mm -hmm. that's the thing. And, and for me, what I prefer to do, like what happened with Katy Perry, is hearing her sing right in, in, my, in my face. She pulled out an acoustic guitar, sang for me, and I went, I love her voice. I loved her presence. I loved her, her natural grace and her, her ability to stand in front of me in a recording studio when I didn't know who she was and be able to deliver that. So she had it, bink, 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 bink. Mm -hmm. The voice, the look, the confidence, the intangible. And so that was an easy one, you know? Yeah. But they're not always that easy. Yeah, I, I think we might have another question for you, Glenn. Will you look at the screen, please? Let's just see what else we have. Okay, Glenn, I have a question for you. Who has been some of your most favorite artists to work in the industry? Maybe, I don't know, someone you took to Japan to record their very first music video. But other than that, who are the people that you admire the most um, that you got to nurture along the way? Baby. <laughs> Thank you. So who are some of your favorites along the way besides Miss well, Katy Perry? Well, I, was, I have to put her in the category of one. Of course, Alanis Morissette. I didn't nurture Dave Matthews, but I sure had a hell of a lot of fun making one record with him. <laughs> and I would say the same thing about an artist named Shelby Lynn, who, uh, again, didn't nurture her, but couldn't have had a better experience, you know, making that record. And so, um, and of course, sort of my first really big hit, Wilson Phillips. They're like my daughters, you know, I love them. Katie, I love you. Aw, that's so sweet. Well, thank you folks for being on the line with us. So I want to dovetail from that, mentioning Alanis Morissette, mentioning Katy Perry. I mean, you're brilliant at spotting talent in these young artists. I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but can you elaborate a bit more? What is it that, that you noticed in them? And talking with people who work with you, they just speak of, of your character and how you're just so giving and you, and you nurture and you mentor. What is it with them? Well, I mean, I, for me, it's a, I, I think I'm a pretty good listener and I'm trying to investigate the artist's intention. And, uh, and sometimes it's a question that it, they're not even asked. Uh, sometimes people have a record deal just based on a projection that a, a record executive has for them 
that they can sound like this artist, or they, there's some comparable that they have. Because it's usually very hard, especially now, for people to see something that's utterly original mm -hmm. and validate it if it doesn't sound like what's already in the marketplace. And so I've always been much more interested in the counter program. I mean, that's just my nature. Green uh, yearbook, yes. You know, and but that's just the kind of music I like. I like mm -hmm. stuff that's a little more a little more textured, that has a I mean, I like McDonald's hamburgers, but I also like a gourmet meal. And I feel like I would prefer the gourmet meal, although the McDonald's is great. And so, <laughs> and they've sold, you know, 70 zillion of them. And I feel like a lot of the music is like a McDonald's hamburger. But, but then you have this great music, that's the great meal. And so, you know, there's something for everyone, mm -hmm. but I've always tended to go there. So if, usually if, if an artist has something that's a little bit left of center, in their thinking or their approach, and I don't mean left politically, but I mean just look, they're not, they're not followers. They right. want to lead, they may not know where they want to go, but they know they don't want to follow. Mm -hmm. And my job is to help the compass yeah. and to say, okay, and is your intention just to have a hit song or do you want to have a long career? And when an artist says they want to have a long career, I'm much more interested in that because I really feel like that's, what I would like to give an artist. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that can make a hit, and there's a kind of a rotating cast of characters who do that, and they're extremely skilled, and there's some really people who do that all the time. I just prefer to do the artistic dive, and I do as, I do, and I never did a lot of volume of records. I just, I would always take a chance on something that I, that I liked. It was that simple. It was just, if, if, it, if I liked it, and I felt there was something there, I'm, I'm crazy enough to just go for it. That's, I've, I've always been instinctive in that way. I've never had a calculated, I mean, with Katie, I signed her in five minutes. I didn't know anything about it. it it's like, because that's the way I am. Right. It's like, if, and when I know it, I know it. And so I knew it with her, I knew it with Atlantis. Um, I knew it with Wilson Phillips. But so does everybody else. So it's not like I was a genius. I just was the first one there, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I think there takes, I, there's such risk involved, though, I think, and especially by today's standards, when someone is willing to go against the norm. Or just that something's a little bit different, because there's such risk. If something is already, a, you know, factored in, there's less of a financial risk, less of a thing. I just really respect the fact that you are, I just see it as bravery in, in being able to recognize that and go for it. Well, I think... People are much more willing, even in the industry now, to take the risk. I think, I mean, you even see it like with a lot of the content on the streaming services. They, they kind of like, kind of, it's the, a very thin gene pool of ideas and kind of styles. And it's time for, you know, some new stuff. Right. And it's a great opportunity for, I think, original people of all kinds, filmmakers, writers, musicians, you know, and, because I think the same old, same old has really been the same old, same old, and it's kind of like a little bit boring at times. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, obviously, I, in a place like Ole Miss, you have an opportunity to take a shot at the great stuff. It's not that that's the only thing you should do, but don't cut yourself off from going for the greatness, you know? I mean, I really think that the long-term value of making a commitment to writing great music or whatever you're writing or whatever you're doing is a worthwhile enterprise. It, it takes your, you know, it takes artistic courage, yeah. and you have to balance it with getting paid. I've done some gigs that I didn't want to do, it, so that I could do the ones that I want to do. Strategize. I mean, come on, you got to <laughs> hustle in this business. <laughs> totally. So I'm curious. Um, Katie mentioned that one of the pieces of advice you gave her as a mentor was that she write a new song every day. Yeah. Talk about the thought process behind that. I mean, you've already shared, you know, get up every day, write to do, but, but what was behind that advice to her? Well, I, I think I got, first of all, I have an enormous amount of energy to do it. And I feel like if I don't get it out, it'll, just, it'll get lost in the ether. So I better, you know, because there's so many times when I'm laying in bed and I have an idea and I don't sit up and write it down and the next day it's like, what the hell was that idea? I'm glad to know I'm not the that, only one. That happens like all the time. So I've just trained myself to just 
oh, get up, get up. because that's where the flashes come from. And that's, that's, those are the building blocks that are really valuable. What's not valuable is to sit and think about, okay, what do I want to write about? You know, I yeah. mean, what, was, what were the 10 hits last year? What can I do that's like that? I mean, are there people that know how to do that? I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. I'd rather take something completely over here and execute it with incredible skill. I mean, you, you, especially when you're a counter programmer, it has to be really good. It has to be better than the, than the normal oatmeal. It really does. So you have to be a master chef. So I'm, I'm trying to train everybody to aspire to be a master chef, but if you end up in the kitchen flipping burgers, that's okay. <laughs> We might end up at McDonald's, and that is all right. I, I, God bless him. <laughs> all right, we are going to shift. Glenn has agreed to play an LMR Live game. We are going to play a game called Guesses with Glenn. It is our take on password. So we're going to get a little video going here to get you in the mood, and then some Guesses with Glenn. back and we are going to play Guesses with Glenn. You may have noticed we've had some other fabulous people join us. Avery, Brian, and Samantha. We have our duo over here versus our duo over here. We are going to allow Team Ballard to go first. Glenn, would you like to give or receive the clue? Give the clue. Fantastic. The next question is, would you like to do artists, places, theater, or film? Places. Places it is. Places it is. So I'm going to give you this card. Please do not let your partner see. I'm going to give you this card. You are allowed to give her one. Oh, let me help you get it out here. Let me see. I don't know how to play. No, no worries. Okay. There is oh. your word. Don't let okay. her see. You're allowed to give a one word clue and see if Avery can guess the place. He said, hometown. Natchez. Oh my gosh! Oh. She got it! Oh. Woo, woo. All right, sorry. How I was like, if it's know? hard, How did you know? if it's hard for you to give these clues, I don't really have much hope for myself. <laughs> 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 All right, I can take that off yeah, your thank hands. You. Thank you. Who's keeping track of the score? All right, thank you, Giovanni. All right. Samantha, would you like to pick a category? People, places, theater, or film? <laughs> Um, I'll do I'll do people people okay. people people would you like to give or receive what do you think she's asking you I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay I'll, I'll give the clue I'll give you the will clue. give okay people thank you and I'm gonna give to you now in case it flips back one word <laughs> we're very strict here yes <laughs> um, um, um. <laughs> This isn't really a word, but it's it's a sound. Um, hee hee. <laughs> Michael Jackson. <Yeah>. That's <laughs> good. That's Wait a good. minute. That's two words. <laughs> On a monopia. I can take that off your hands. hands. <laughs> They're too good. They're well, too I thought good. of Man in the Mirror, uh, but. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Avery. Would you like people, theater, places, or film? Film. Film. Film it is. All right. To you. And to you. Do not let your opponent see. Okay, okay. <laughs> I 
Mobile. Mobile? Mm -hmm. We're talking places? It's people. Pe oh, people. Wait, I think Wait, it's what? film. You Is it film? <laughs> Did I give you the wrong one? Yeah, you get this film. I don't know anybody named Mobile. Oh, yeah. I did, I did. Okay. But it is, a, or, or maybe right. it's my friend She's right. She's right. This is good. This is good. This is good. It is film. We're perplexed. Oh, Mobile is a film? Mobile? It's in the film. <laughs> One word. Uh, you get to I need to, to, to Do you name want to a film. Pass? You could just name, 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 name any. Okay, film. Uh, Top Gun. Okay, that is not correct. This is getting juicy. All right. Here. Gotham. <laughs> These are good clues. These are good These clues. Are good. Wait, are they are they the same movie? It's the same movie. So this is the second clue. <laughs> We're not sure I thought I knew what it was. Name any movie. <laughs> Gotham. Mm -hmm. Um. Batman? Yep. Yes! Yes, 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 yes! Batman was in Mobile? That's what I, I was going to say Sweet Home Alabama, and then I was like, Gotham really threw me. The Batmobile. Batmobile. <laughs> oh, my. The Batmobile. <laughs> yes. Well, you have a dance cap, please? Uh, I didn't realize. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Okay, I'm so, a very slow, I'm very liberal niche. sometimes. <laughs> Where are we? Who's choosing? You get to choose this time. Um, we'll do people again. People again. People, people, people. Here and here, but you're gonna hold tight. He gets to go first. What if I don't know who it is? <laughs> Just um, make a clue. <laughs> Can I change the topic? Nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. It's okay. First thought. Best thought. Rules of improv. You got this. I really don't. Just pick a <laughs> word. Any word. Um. Sorry, unfortunately, I am not telepathic. <laughs> I really don't know. Um. Uh. Shoot. Someone male. Male. There's a good clue. Hmm, Fifty percent of the population. No. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Well, I guess I'm going to guess Glenn Ballard, our lovely guest. Good guess. Good guess, but that is not correct. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to give a clue. Peek at that there. We'll get you. We'll get this out. Is that male, M-A-L-E, or M-A-I-L? <laughs> good point. Good All point. Right. <laughs> uh, Every day. That didn't get much easier for you. <laughs> and it's a person. Correct? It's a person. Mm hmm Who has been mentioned tonight. Every day. Mm-hmm. Every day. Mm-hmm. Is it Michael Jackson? No. Ah. No, but is it okay? Okay, okay, get creative. Get creative. Remember, you could the tone you could take. Maybe you want to rhyme. I don't know. Just throw it at me. I got it. I got it. Yeah, okay, she said she's taking rhyme, right? Could, yeah. Save. Dave Matthews. Yeah. All right. Okay. What is the score, by the way? No, we're winning at Glenn Ballard's own. You're still liking me. <laughs> all right, all I right. I am the weak member of the team. <laughs> that is not true. That I'm, is I'm not true. I'm coming off the bench. No. You're the starter. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Here we go. We're going to do three more. Three more. All right? Oh, I'm in. What would you like? Theater, places, or film? Let's go back to places. Places it is. Places it is. You're giving. You're giving this time. I think it's your turn. Oh, I think so. so. We're just going to go with oh, that. So <laughs> this is a very thoughtful group. Very and you said one word. Correct? One word. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. And okay. it's not he he. <laughs> <laughs> it won the point. Oh, it In did. my defense. 
Duke. <laughs> and this is a what <laughs> Carolina. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. We're gonna move on. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Your clue is hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> One more time. It's a place. Hello. <laughs> yes, it is a place. England. I mean, I don't know. Getting getting warmer, getting warmer. That's a very big warmer. place. Yeah. Okay, you guys could get this. I have a good feeling. Okay, I've got okay. it. I've got a feeling. It has to be one word. <laughs> and these are phrases. <laughs> the queen? Is that one word? <laughs> queen. Oh, London. Yes! All right, yes. all right, all right, all right, all right. So you guys, okay, okay, so it is now 2-3, right? Okay. We're neck and neck. Neck and yeah. neck, neck and neck. Very powerful. is gone. I know. God rest our souls. All right, back so over here. Wait, who's deciding? I've lost track. I, I think us. Yeah, I think it's All right. 3-2. I'll, I'll choose a film. Film. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Can it be a gesture instead of a word? Just put a word with the gesture. Okay. We'll oh, 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 perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Nose. Pinocchio. Oh! We're going to play one more just for kicks Slam and giggles. <laughs> kicks and giggles. Kicks and giggles. Kicks and giggles. We all lost. Right. It's all right. It's all right. It's the fun, though, right? We're still winning. All right. We're, still winning. We're not taking it personally. All right. No, all right. Not. For three, oh, 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 all right. The rules have so changed. It is theater. This will be the grand finale. I, was like, I feel right. like I will so all know the answer, but I don't time. know. Okay, like, here we go. Don't, don't, don't worry, I'm a theater major. It's okay, we can do it then. Okay. Yes, you get to go first. Uh, Sorry, I have my microphone. Um. Sorry, I didn't help you this time. Let me do that. I got it. Yeah, I mean, just give me. Whoopi? She's getting so many clues. Is this sister out? Good guess. Oh, that was going to be guess. my guess. <laughs> Good guess. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Whoopi and who? Mm. Uh, I don't know. Um. This should be, this should be easy for me. But <gasps> Ghost. Yeah. That is correct. <laughs> Very nice. All right, we have to do the last card. There's only one more for Pete's sake. Come we're on, just gonna let's do, do it. it. Yes. Come on, we're gonna this do it. Like one more. One more. One more. One more. This is like you know, All our right. participation trophy Am comes I with this. Clue? <laughs> or is she giving a clue? She's gonna go first. Okay. Oh, this is this is hard a little bit. Oh, um, <laughs> oh actually no, um, Alanis. No, not at Atlantis, Alanis. <laughs> the, the lady, the woman, the singer. Okay, those are more than one word. No, no I'm, I'm just clarifying. I'm <laughs> clarifying <laughs> that I meant Alanis, not Atlantis, <laughs> the place. That made it harder. <laughs> Do y'all know it? It's theater. Five seconds. Oh, oh she's getting five got seconds. Timer. Hmm. Any word? Titanic. Oh. Okay, okay. I know nothing about this one. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're we're <laughs> we're getting clues Ironic. over here. <laughs> Ironic. And, and, and what's the category? Theater. Oh, Jagged Little Pill, the musical. Woohoo! Very nice. That Very nice. That's so a gimme. So what is our final score, that's, Ms. Giovanna? That's our mulligan. They won. All right. We're still winners. Well, it's good. 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 Very much so. So we have oh, little happies absolutely. for you all. Gracious in defeat. Little happies. Little Thank happies. you. And we don't, we, 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 we
we're, we're still winners. It's okay. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. exactly. Right. exactly. Winning. I'm just happy exactly. to be here. Exactly. Congratulate you on a stunning victory, and thank you for for making us look so bad. <laughs> Hey, well, thank you for having such an interesting life that you have all these amazing and difficult clues. I agree. I agree. So it's pretty cool that we have alum here. We have current students. We have Glenn back to campus. It's like Glenn has done a full 360, which is going to take us into our next segment, which is LMR 360. We are going to catch up with one of our Ole Miss alumni and former Dream Team members, Cody Arthur. Cody Arthur is a 2017 graduate from the University of Mississippi Department of Music and a former member of the LMR Dream Team. After completing his degree, Cody headed off to Houston, Texas, where he earned his Master of Music and Vocal Performance at the University of Houston. Cody's mosaic career as performer, an educator, and arts administrator is highlighted in performing with the Houston Grand Opera in the chorus and as a soloist. He will be premiering a new album with the prestigious Chapelwood United Methodist Church, and this summer, he'll be traveling to Germany for the Bachfest Leipzig with Bach Society Houston. Here's what Cody had to say about his time with LMR. You know, my time with LMR gave me so much more than just performing opportunities. It gave me training and um, opportunities to meet other like-minded individuals who wanted to grow and develop into something more than just a performer. Um, I think it was always obvious that performing was what I wanted to do, but that there would have to be more than that to have a completely fulfilling career in the arts. And um, I think about my time with LMR and my experiences as I teach, as I perform, as I do all of the behind the scenes things in arts admin jobs that I've held, and about how that opportunity to work with LMR really, really developed me into the person that I am today. Cody, we are sending you big virtual hugs. We are so proud of you and please keep us informed on all the things you're doing and you are welcome back anytime. So I am curious, Glenn, what does it feel like coming back to campus? What does it feel like? It feels very green, first of all. <laughs> Get back to our green kind of theme. Yes. It feels uh, it feels like spring, and it literally is spring. But I I feel an enormous sea change in really the whole sensibility around here. Uh, you know, we have a lot of stuff to, to reconcile here, and I see that the that the work is going on. You know, and I I just like the diversity now. I like the openness, and it's still the coolest place to go to school. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, this, uh, the vibe of friendliness and of, like, caring is, is kind of like an anomaly in this very contentious world right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I do feel like it's a sanctuary of sorts. And uh, so coming back, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm living in big cities now. It's always wonderful to, to kind of escape all of that and to come back here, and, but to see how much it's developed and grown. And, you know, I, I'm very much interested in the arts that's, that's happening here. And what I've seen is truly a renaissance of, I mean, look, when I was going to school here, it wasn't all put together yet, you know? It was, I mean, you know, it was, it was spread out and, there just wasn't a vision for it yet. Mm -hmm. I really see that there's a, a huge vision for all the arts kind of working together. Uh, I've, sp I've spent about 10 years at USC working with their music programs there, and they make it a point to try to involve film, film students, theater students. They have a school of dance now. And, and it's a great way, again, for you to interact with people who who you might be working with someday, and you get to do it for free. You know, you get to do yeah. well, except for the tuition. But, <laughs> but what I mean is, is, you you have an opportunity to experiment. You know, absolutely. And so I, you know, I, I was down at the new facility today with the film school. I see, I mean, this facility is one of the great facilities, really. And I think it, all the 
I mean, this wasn't here. The Fortune wasn't here when I was going to school here. And 20 years ago, I guess you opened, right? Yeah. It's really one of the finest rooms I've ever been in. And I've worked in a lot of theaters, but it was beautifully designed. So I think it's kind of like the jewel and the crown here. Of like, you can put on anything in there and, and feel like it's a quality. The sound is great. The sight lines are great. And I just think you're, it's, it feels like you're building this whole kind of web around what can happen on a creative level, you know, music, writing, theater, you know, production of all kinds. And they're all so related and in, in some ways they're all kind of coming to, to some kind of like synergistic whole. And so I, I, that's my first thing is like I see a huge amount of, of growth on every level, but I also feel like the sensibility has grown enormously and, and is very much in tune with, with today's world, you know. I did not pay him to say that. Uh, that was fantastic, truth. and uh, it's amazing. That means the world, that you, you're having those observations, and I really believe the best is yet to come for us. There is so much potential here, and it really is such an honor having you here. And speaking of that space, if you are in the Oxford area, not just the Oxford area, I mean, I don't care how many hours away you are, get yourself here tomorrow night to experience the Medal for the Arts, because Glenn Ballard himself will be performing, as well as some incredible alumni, faculty, and students. It's going to be a spectacular evening. It is our version of the Kennedy Center Honors in that magnificent Sam and Mary Haskell Theater at the Gertrude C. Ford Center at the University of Mississippi. Um, they're telling me to wrap it up. I don't want to wrap it up. I want to stay here forever. I just for a moment, I just want to breathe it in. This is fantastic, Glenn. Seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our LMR supporters and partners, our loyal viewers via the web, College of Liberal Arts, Department of Music, the academic and advisory boards for the University of Mississippi Institute for the Arts, our LMR Giving Group, the Secret Salon Society. If you'd like to join that group, please reach out. We are looking for people who want to be arts advocates. And just remember, we are about education, outreach, and entertainment. I want to thank Development Officer Caroline Horan, who has worked tirelessly on making all of this happen. I want to thank my partner, Executive Managing Director Brady Bramlett. It's a joy working with you. Absolutely. I want to thank graduate assistant Giovanna Correa Coleman. I'll keep it together. She's going to be graduating if I allow her. No, I'm kidding. Of course she's going to graduate. But I just want to keep her selfishly. Appreciate all that you do, Giovanna. And our undergraduate assistants. We are intentional about making sure our undergraduates are having experiences outside of the classroom. Benton Donahue, Maya Taylor, Ben Curry. Let's give a round of applause to all of these people. I also need to thank Jordan Presley, Multimedia Specialist for the Music Department. Great team member. Give it up again. And one more time, I want to thank Glenn Ballard for coming home to Mississippi, letting the University of Mississippi honor you. Thank you for spending your time. We can always make more t money, but we can't get, get more time. And you have intentionally chosen to spend this week with our students, with our faculty, and having great impact. So can we give this man a hottie toddy? Let's do it. And the people said, hottie toddy. And remember, the music revolution continues. Till next time, next season. See ya. You're so good. Thank you.